Let's go ahead and get started. Um, today it's a great pleasure to have Dr. Sun from Georgia Tech. And uh, Dr. Sun is a, a currently a research professor in School of uh, Aerospace Engineering. And uh, he received his bachelor's and master's from Tsinghua University and at uh, MIT in China. Right? <laughs> And he got his PhD from mechanical and aerospace engineering from Princeton. And uh, his research mainly focused on chemical kinetics and also uh, plasma acetic combustion. That's the topic for today. So talk about plasma acetic ammonia combustion, one of the very hot topic now. Um, he received many awards from combustion community, and uh, including the, the Lewis Fellowship from Combustion Institute, and this green paper award and also uh, the very famous Plasma Young Investigator Award. Um, he also uh, received the Air Force uh, Young Investigator Award in uh, 2016. And recently, he also got the, the, the SUDI Award. That's a very famous award for young investigators. Um, with that, let's welcome Dr. Sun. Yeah, thank you very much for the nice introduction. Um, oh, thank all of you. It's a great honor to have the opportunity to be here to share our recent work with you. I truly enjoyed my visit and enjoyed the beautiful campus um, doing my visit. Uh, so today I will talk about a recent work about a plasma assisted ammonium combustion. But before I touch this, I would like to take the opportunity oh, sorry, <laughs> to introduce you our combustion lab at Georgia Tech. So the top picture is a direct photograph of our building. The red building, the entire building is dedicated for combustion research. And different from most uh, academic labs, and uh, we share the research facility. We share everything, space, equipment, and this uh, building hosts about 13 faculties doing combustion, all doing combustion research in the lab. And we have about 60 graduate students working in the lab, of course, a number of faculties. And we have about eight research engineers uh, working on different projects. And we have also two full-time staff to support the operation of the combustion lab. Every year, we take a group photo. Of course, not everybody can be in the photo. And the top right corner picture is the aerial view of the combustion lab. In the combustion lab, we do a variety of projects, but with a focus on fundamental science at realistic conditions. Typically, realistic conditions means high temperature, high pressure, typical engine conditions. For example, we have a gas turbine simulator, and we study gas turbine combustion in it. And we also have a, a, what do we call this jet engine simulator. It's a high pressure vessel. And we uh, simulated the engine conditions, high temperature, high pressure conditions. And we have a, a sector of a jet engine combustors inside of the engine and study, for example, suiting phenomena uh, for jet fuels and also future uh, uh, sustainable aviation fuel. We work on our sprays, this shiny burner. Before we do anything, we take picture. That's the only time it could shine. Uh, uh, we, we study liquid fuel spray into different engine systems. And we conduct different optical diagnostics to study the combustion process. And this picture is one of my new facilities, which is a shock tube. It is 21 meter long and occupies the entire left wing of the combustion building. Um, and we use this shock tube to create high temperature, high pressure conditions instantaneously, so we can study the chemical reactions inside of the shock tube, measure some parameters in it. And also this one, and it's, uh, we already removed it, but uh, we built this up at a, a, uh, as an industry go furnace to study the combustion process there. And among the 13 faculties, we also have uh, three faculties working on numerical combustion. So they do not really occupy lab space, but they use computers. Um, and they do a variety of uh, simulations, like, like a large eddy simulation, and a direct numerical simulation to model different uh, combustion systems. So if you are considering an uh, advanced degree in the future, and uh, think about us. So let's uh, uh, switch the gear back to uh, uh, plasma-assisted combustion. So first, for plasma-assisted combustion is ammonia combustion. In recent about 10 to 20 years, ammonia started to draw lots of attention from, the, from researchers worldwide. And that the reason is ammonia can be considered as a carbon-free fuel. So it can contribute for the decarbonization process. Uh, ammonia has some really nice features to, uh, to be used as a fuel. For example, it has no carbon, which is really nice, making it very attractive. 
It also has a high energy density, volumetric energy density, comparing to hydrogen and, of course, the battery. Um, and uh, its physical property is very similar to a liquid petroleum gas. So it's, uh, we know how to transport a large scale ammonia around. And ammonia is a very important component to make fertilizers. So, so every year, we make a huge amount of ammonia. So we do have knowledge on how to make large amount of ammonia. So these properties make ammonia really attractive as a fuel. And in the future, now people are uh, proposing the ideas calling, uh, called, uh, called blue ammonia, green ammonia. So we can synthesize ammonia in the future using renewable fuels. So we can close the loop of carbon production in this process if we could use ammonia as a fuel. There are different ways to use ammonia as a fuel. And uh, ammonia can be considered as a hydrogen carrier. And we can, because hydrogen is very dangerous to handle, it's very explosive. So we could use ammonia as a hydrogen carrier, and we decompose ammonia and create a hydrogen and burn hydrogen, even though it's not easy uh, at this moment. And uh, the most easiest way, uh, the most easy way, or the easiest way, sorry, it probably is to burn ammonia directly as a fuel, just burn it like natural gas. However, it's very challenging. And back to 40 and 50s, and actually the combustion community already studied the ammonia and whether we can use it as an alternative fuel. Quickly, the conclusion was, no, ammonia was not suitable to be a fuel because some, uh, some outstanding challenges. One is uh, the flame propagation speed of ammonia is very small. It's just about a seven centimeter per second. And just for reference, uh, if you burn natural gas at a standard temperature pressure conditions, flame propagation speed is about 40 centimeter per second. So the flow speed, the flame propagation speed is so low, so it's very difficult to stabilize the flame inside of the combustor. And also, people observed that ammonia was not that reactive. So it's very difficult to ignite ammonia flame. That is what we observed all the time in the lab. And another feature, interestingly, was not mentioned in the uh, old time, uh, but uh, it's uh, the most important issue now is emissions. And ammonia combustion features an extremely high NOx emission. And typical ammonia flame give you thousands of ppm, for example, 5,000, uh, 3,000. And what is the EPA standard? EPA standard is below 10 ppm. So we are two orders of magnitude higher than the EPA standard now. So we cannot really use ammonia as a fuel at this moment. And uh, just an uh, 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 interesting figure from a very important figure uh, from a very important paper talking about ammonia combustion a few years ago. And this figure shows you the emissions of NO and also ammonia as part of the emission from an ammonia flame. As you can see, if we burn fuel in, which, mean, which is a typical condition for combustors, which means less fuel, a little bit more oxygen, uh, extra oxygen in the combustor, and you can see the NO emission is thousands of ppm, which is very typical. And if we move to fuel-rich condition, and the NO emission can decrease pretty dramatically, but at the same time, ammonia starts to leak from the flame because it's low reactivity. So ammonia emission become to be thousands of ppm, and if you add them up, probably it's difficult to find a sweet spot you can burn ammonia. And ammonia itself is hazardous, so it's also emission. Another important feature of ammonia combustion is it produces a lot of hydrogen in the exhaust. That is also what we observe in our experiments. Uh, hydrogen is produced in the exhaust, so the exhaust of ammonia flame is pretty dangerous, and we cannot simply use ammonia as a fuel. So by looking at the, uh, the points over here, ammonia has some really good features to be at the field. But um, at the same time, ammonia also has some really bad features and make it not, a, uh, make it not a suitable to be a field. So what can we do about ammonia combustion? If we consider the combustion process in general as a global reaction, we can burn fuel, whatever fuel, let's say hydrocarbon, and uh, react with oxygen, generate CO2 water, and then release heat. Your daily experience tells you, you, if you mix the fuel and the oxygen together, they don't react, unless you ignite them using the igniter. And the igniter provides the initial energy and for the fuel and oxygen mixture to overcome a reaction barrier we call activation energy. Normally for combustion process, activation energy is high. That's why flame must be hot, right? Otherwise, it cannot provide enough energy to heat up reactants to overcome this barrier again. Um, this feature makes flame is very difficult to, uh, uh, to survive 
um, are at extreme conditions, for example, low temperature conditions. So flame just simply die. And to enhance the combustion process at extreme conditions, plasma-assisted combustion technique was proposed. And to use plasma to enhance combustion process, just in case you are not very familiar with the plasma, and the plasma we are talking about here refers to electrical discharge. If you have two electrodes, for example, metal, and you connect the two metal electrodes with a high voltage, when the voltage is high enough, it can ionize the gas, generate a, uh, ionize the gas, a weakly ionize the gas. And the weakly ionized gas is called plasma. The most common example of plasma might be the lightning that we see uh, 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 often in our daily life. And when we talk about flame or combustion system, there is only one temperature, 2,000 Kelvin, 1,000 Kelvin. That actually refers to the translational temperature of the system because vibrational temperature or other temperatures are in thermal equilibrium with translational temperature. We only know one temperature. But when talking about plasma systems, plasma can be highly non-equilibrium. So we need to talk about several temperatures, like uh, electron temperature. And for uh, plasma is ionized, so electron has a very high temperature or high energy. And also the molecules are vibrationally excited. So you, we have vibrational temperature, and we also have a translational temperature. And the three temperatures can be very different. The electron temperature can be as high as 10,000 Kelvin or above, and the vibrational temperature can be several thousands of Kelvin. And well translational temperature can be remain low, let's say several hundred Kelvin. So that's a typical feature of plasma. So in this way, we can take advantage of the high electron temperature and high vibrational temperature to help the fuel and oxidizer to overcome this reaction barrier and to make combustion occur at a low translational temperature. So this is the idea of plasma-assisted combustion. If I can make a cartoon and to demonstrate this process, I throw a high-energy electron into the combustion system. It can help me to break fuel and oxygen, generate radicals. Then radicals can continue reacting with the fuel because the activation energy between uh, uh, fuel and radicals are pretty low. They can form carbon dioxide, they can form water, and they release heat. And then at the same time form other radicals. So this is the kinetic role of plasma. So uh, from, uh, from this review, and we can say, hey, if we introduce plasma into ammonia combustion systems, a plasma can definitely enhance the, uh, the ammonia combustion process. But the one thing we are not sure, and how about NOx? And uh, this thing does not talk anything about NOx formation. So let's do some experiments. And in our experiments, and we employed a gas turbine combustor. It's a, uh, uh, they have the same feature. And for example, we have a fuel and oxidizer mixed inside uh, 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 the tube. And then the mixture goes through a swirler, generating swirling flow. Swirling flow is a typical technique used by jet engine and gas turbine combustors, generating swirling flow to stabilize the flow inside of the combustor. So in this way, we can study the flame dynamics. And downstream, we have a glass tube, and it can find the flame inside the tube to introduce plasma into the combustor. And we, uh, uh, we installed two electrodes. One is a center rod, and outside is a ring. So we connect a high voltage between the two electrodes, and we can ionize the mixture flowing between these two electrodes. And in this study, we use the nanosecond pulse discharge, which means we generate a high voltage pulse, and each pulse only lasts about 12 nanoseconds. So the overall uh, power consumption is pretty low. It's normally about 2 to 3% of the power of the flame. So this is the direct photograph of the combustor. Um, in our past study, we studied the methane air flame and how plasma enhanced methane air flame. So a few years ago, and we found if we have a plasma and we could significantly extend uh, or enhance a, a, a methane air flame. For example, in our experiments, we first have a, a methane flame. Then we gradually decrease the fuel concentration and the flame becomes weaker and weaker. At a, one moment, and the fuel blow off. And we call that condition lean blowout limit. So it gives us the operating window of, of your combustor. So the bottom limit. And if there is no fuel, of course, there is no flame. So at a condition, for example, phi is equal to 0.55, very lean condition. Without a plasma, you cannot have a methane air flame inside the combustor. But if we turn the plasma on, as you can see the blue 
colored flame, that is a typical methane flame. And we can uh, stabilize the flame inside the combustor, which means plasma can extend the limb below out limit and make the operating window of the combustor larger. If we burn linear, we can also save fuel. And we also found with the help of plasma and the combustion efficiency improved. And this figure on the right shows you the CO emission we measured in the exhaust. And with the plasma, the open symbol, and with all the plasma, you see with the plasma and the CO concentration decreased. That means we improved the combustion efficiency by converting more CO to carbon dioxide. At the same time, we measured the NOx emission, majorly NO. As you can see, the right solid symbol shows the NO concentration with all the plasma. It's pretty low, it's below EPA standard. If we turn the plasma on, NOx start to pop up. Now it's above EPA standard, so we have an additional about 50 to 60 ppm addition of NOx. And majorly, our future, uh, uh, our following study showed, hey, this is from the plasma itself. It's not really from the flame, because plasma barely changes, for example, the flame temperature based on energy conservation. Um, so then, a, a, a couple of years ago, and we started to think, we started to think about plasma-assisted ammonia combustion. But based on our previous experience, we stuck. We know if we add plasma into the system, and pretty much we can expect flame, ammonia flame can be enhanced. But how about NOx emissions? NOx emissions are really high. Right now, I have plasma, I make it worse. And I had this idea in early 2019s, and I stuck, I talked to my student, he agreed with me, and we didn't do anything. And uh, a few months later, and suddenly one day I realized, hey, the NOx emission in ammonia flame is already very high. Why I care about additional 50, 60 ppm addition? Somebody gonna deal with it, but not me. So I talked to my student, let's do it, see what's gonna happen. And so we started experiment by the end of 2019. So, uh, really quick, before we publish our result, there are only two relevant work, uh, our numerical in the literature. And back to 2018, a Japanese group studied uh, a plasma-assisted ammonia combustion by using numerical simulation. They simply consider, hey, you know, plasma can generate some OH radicals. Let's add some OH radicals, assume it is from the plasma and into the combustion systems and they found the addition of OH radical can enhance flame propagation speed, and it is more efficient than just thermal heating. Um, and the result is pretty obvious. And uh, uh, another work is from a research group from Technion in 2021, and they also con uh, uh, conducted some numerical simulations and modeled ammonia oxygen helium mixture ignition. And they found, yeah, you know, plasma can generate the OH radicals, and the OH radical can accelerate the ignition. Um, and also, uh, the uh, discharge uh, repetition frequency will affect uh, the effectiveness on, uh, on shortening the uh, ignition delay. But basically, and they found plasma generated OH radicals, and OH radicals obviously can enhance the combustion process. So that is being said. Our work was the first work and on experimental plasma-assisted combustion. So we switch the fuel, uh, of course it's not that simple to use ammonia in the lab, it's another six months fight and, uh, with your school and to safely bring ammonia into the lab because it's hazardous. And we measure the limb below out limit and with plasma and without plasma. So the black line shows the limb below out limit without plasma. That means if we decrease the fuel concentration and when we reach a fire is around, for example, 0.6 or 0.7, something like that, flame disappears, <laughs> flame is blowing out. If we turn on the plasma, and uh, when we have the discharge voltage like a six kilovolts, and uh, we see little effect. And then we increase the discharge voltage to 11 kilovolts, but we maintain the same uh, discharge power, and we see pretty significant uh, extension of limb below out limit. If we further increase the discharge voltage to 15 kilovolts, we see pretty dramatic enhancement of the flame by extending the uh, limb below out limit, for example, from 0.7 to 0.4 something. That means, hey, plasma can definitely enhance the flame. And here, just for your reference, um, and we took pictures at a different condition. For example, at condition A, 
This is the picture of the flame, ammonia flame, it's an orange colored flame, very different from methane. And the flame is stabilized, it's pretty robust in the combustor. If we turn on the plasma, flame becomes to be stronger and still stabilized in the combustor. And moving to condition B here, by reducing the fuel concentration, the reactivity of the mixture starts to decrease. As you can see, the flame is trying to leave the surface of the combustor, trying to be blown off. Um, if you turn on the plasma, and flame can be stabilized inside of the combustor. If we move to a condition right above the blown off, as you can see, the morphology of the flame already changed. Um, and uh, if we further decrease fuel concentration, flame gonna disappear inside of the combustor. If we turn on the plasma, and the flame can be stabilized, as you can see, the shape of the flame is very similar to this one, even though it's weaker, because the fuel concentration is much lower at this moment. But we could still stabilize flame here. Move to condition D without a plasma, flame already blown off. So it's just a dark picture. And uh, if we turn on the plasma, and you can see if some kind of flame still exists inside of the combustor and it's, it's uh, anchored at the nozzle surface. So now move to emission side. How about a NOx emission? We use gas and leather measured a uh, NOx emission at the combustor uh, exit, uh, it's downstream of the combustor. And what we found is without a plasma, ammonia flame as usual give us very high NOx emission. In this case, it's about 26 ppm, and it's a benchmark result and marked by this dashed line. Then we turn on the plasma. We conduct experiments at a different voltage, discharge voltage, and different uh, discharge power. And what we found is, as far as we have a plasma, and the NOx concentration starts to decrease. So it's telling us plasma can enhance flame, at the same time reduce NOx emission. Seems too good to be true. Initially, I didn't believe the result. I told students something must be wrong. You know, we know plasma is going to generate more NOx. How come NOx is low? He agreed. And uh, we decided to go back to the lab and repeat experiments. And during early 2020, we repeated experiments we observed the same thing. And then I said, the gas analyzer must be wrong. So let's send it back for service. Pandemic started then, and we waited, and until the library opened, we got the new gas analyzer, and then we repeated experiments, we observed the same thing. And then we start to believe, hey, this is a true operation. Plasma can enhance flame, at the same time help reduce NOx emission, even though we are still way above EPA standard, but it's a really good sign telling us the benefits of plasma in the application of ammonia combustion. So we published the results, and after that, as there are several literature showed up in, uh, 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 in different publications, and here I uh, quote two examples, and this is a research from a Korean group, and uh, they measure NOx emission with the help of AC plasma, the black lines are NO emissions without a plasma, and the red lines are NO emissions with plasma. As you can see, there is a pretty significant change in terms of NO concentration or NO reduction by applying plasma. And the work from a Chinese group also showed, showed a similar results. I was very happy to see, uh, to see those results because their results are consistent with our observation. As a researcher, right, we need to ask a follow-up question and why plasma can decrease uh, uh, NOx emission. Doesn't the plasma create more uh, uh, NOx? Um, so to explain that, uh, uh, to answer that question, and let's look at uh, the ammonia oxidation reaction pathway. So the first step of ammonia oxidation is uh, H abstraction reaction. So H3 becomes to be an H2. So this is what we know not really well, so, but we know for a long time because our recent study showed our understanding about ammonia kinetics is still problematic. Uh, and first it goes to H2. Then H2 will be oxidized the finally form nitrogen. This is what we want. But during the oxidation of H2, it will form NO. And it will also consume NO. So NO in the oxidation of ammonia is an intermediate species. It has to be formed, but it has to be consumed and in this process to form nitrogen. So for those are not consumed by uh, doing uh, the oxidation process, it stay in the exhaust. That's why we have a very high NO emissions. So probably based on the reaction pathways, NH2 is the key species 
we need to understand and how it reduces NO and in the combustion process of ammonia. And here are also uh, are two recent works from ammonia combustor testing. And this figure we already know, with the increase of fuel concentration or when we move from lean side to the rich side, NO concentration decrease and ammonia concentration increase. And what I want to show you is, and the researchers show, uh, conducted uh, OH chemiluminescence measurement and also NH2 star chemiluminescence measurement. And what they found is they, 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 they claimed a relationship. The decrease of OH star and the increase of NH2 star and is correlated with a NO reduction. Uh, so OH star and NH2 star means, the star means electronically excited species. Those are not really the OH species or NH2 species we are talking about in this figure. That is, those are the electronic species. Um, we do not know the relationship between NH2 star and NH2, but measuring NH2 is very challenging. So NH2 star or NH2 star, NH2 star chemiluminescence measurement probably is the, it's not the most appropriate approach, but probably the best approach we can implement quickly and to study this problem. So we uh, implemented NH2 star chemiluminescence measurement, but at the same time we introduced the OH PLEAF measurement. So OH PLEAF measurement is measuring the OH, not the OH star, so it's more relevant and for the problem, and in this measurement. Um, and here, uh, this slide summarizes some of the instantaneous NH2 star chemiluminescence measurement. Um, and this, this is a condition without a plasma at 5 is equal to 0.94. As you can see, this is the NH2 chemiluminescence at different times. So we use the high-speed camera. And the bottom figure shows the NH2 chemiluminescence with plasma and uh, obviously, and uh, with the plasma on, the H2 star chemiluminescence signal is much stronger. Uh, as I said, we do not know the relationship between H2 star and NH2, but it's not unreasonable to say stronger H2 star chemiluminescence signal means higher, potentially higher H, uh, uh, concentration of uh, NH2. Um, this slide shows you the time average of the measurement of NH2 star chemiluminescence. So this figure is pretty difficult to see. Uh, that is the flame without a plasma, the time average the NH2 star chemiluminescence. And when conduct experiments are different discharge voltage and different discharge power. As you can see, with the increase of discharge voltage and also discharge power, um, and the NH2 star chemiluminescence signal increase. So it's kind of uh, indicating and with the increase of discharge voltage or discharge power, and there is more production of NH2 in the combustion system and potentially could enhance the flame and help reduce uh, uh, NO emission. So this is the case with plasma. And we want to know um, how, uh, so this is the case with the flame, and we also want to know what if there is no flame, and could plasma itself produce any NH2 star or NH2 in the system? So we then further decrease the, the fuel concentration, now the equivalence ratio is decreased to 0.48. This is the below the flammability of ammonium air mixture, so no flame. And you see chemiluminescence, but the, the chemiluminescence is from uh, plasma discharge itself, and we focus the camera near the nozzle exit, so we only see what is coming out downstream of the discharge. As you can see, with the increase of discharge power and also discharge voltage, um, and we see strong NH2 star chemiluminescence. That means plasma itself is producing, is, a, uh, is oxidizing ammonia and oxygen mixture inside of the discharge cell, and uh, uh, generating, generating an H2 star. Uh, we also observe if we shut down the fuel, so there's no fuel, which means phi is equal to zero, there's no signal, it's confirmed, you know, the chemiluminescence is from H2 star. And uh, if we add more fuel into the flow, um, and H2 uh, star chemiluminescence also become to be uh, stronger. With all those, uh, with, with all those experiments, 
and we are confirmed the plasma can enhance the production of NH2 star to be scientifically rigorous. Uh, and also there are some interesting phenomena we observe is the concentration of the fuel will affect the discharge properties, even though we fix the power. Uh, but this is a, a, another topic uh, 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 researchers can work on re related with uh, plasma instability. So we will not dig into it today. Um, this slide summarizes the OH PLIF result. Uh, OH PLIF is relatively easy to measure because it has a very strong signal noise ratio compared to other techniques I will talk about. Uh, so this is the instantaneous measurement of OH PLIF, and this is the time average, time average OH PLIF result. As you can see, without a plasma, this is a, a, a distribution of OH along the center plane uh, of the combustor because we are doing planar laser induced fluorescence. And with the plasma discharge, as you can see, with the increase of discharge voltage, flame, uh, the OH distribution becomes broader and also stronger. It means more OH exists inside of the combustor to enhance the flame. Uh, still, we did something similar. We shut down, we decreased the fuel concentration to a very low value. So there is no flame and uh, without a plasma. And with the plasma, as you can see, some OH is flowing out from the discharge cell and it goes into uh, uh, the uh, combustor and help to enhance the combustion process. So plasma itself can oxidize ammonia even at a very low temperature, for example, room temperature or above. So now a new question popped up. You know, when we look at the kinetic models and what we can find in the literature, um, and there are two possible reactions can help to produce an H2 star. And one is called a direct electron impact. Direct electron impact means high energy electrons collide with the fuel molecule, then break the chemical bond of the molecule and generate an excited H2 star. This is the one possible reaction pathways. And based on the record in the literature, this reaction should be pretty strong. And the second reaction is ammonia molecules react with the OH and form unstable H2 and called an H2 star. So now we've got two reaction pathways. We were wondering whether one gonna dominate or both of them are important. So we conduct experiments by measuring the NH2 chemiluminescence, uh, NH2 star chemiluminescence by changing the oxygen concentration. If we cut the oxygen concentration in the fuel, for example, no, uh, no oxygen. So then we leave it ourselves to this direct, direct electron impact because there's no oxygen, that means no OH. So what we found is that if there is no oxygen in the system and the NH2 star chemiluminescence is extremely weak, extremely weak, very difficult to see. But as far as we add oxygen into the flow and the signal becomes to be stronger, there is a kind of a linear relationship between the signal intensity and with oxygen concentration. So this result is suggesting in plasma-assisted ammonia combustion and this reaction is dominated to produce an H2 star, and probably this reaction is also the dominant reaction to help, uh, to help to produce an H2 in the discharge system. And by now, we have uh, OH PLIF results about measuring uh, uh, OH distribution along the center plane. We also have an H2 camera luminescence, but that is a line of sight measurement. We just use the camera to look through the flame. So we did a, a bell uh, inversion and uh, added these two profiles together and what we can see is inside, so for example, this blue purple color distribution is OH. And outside of the OH regime, there's a very thin layer, and that is H2 chemiluminescence. So this observation um, is consistent with our uh, 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 results, and uh, OH is helping produce H2 star. Uh, that is the dominant reaction pathways. Um, so we worked on H2 chemical, uh, star chemiluminescence simply because it is easy, um, and, but it, it's not the most appropriate way to tell whether you have more H2 or not because there is no clear relationship between H2 star and H2. So in recent few months, and we started to work on NH and NH2 uh, laser-induced fluorescence measurement. So by, with the help of different lasers, and we are probing NH2 now, and also NH along the center line of the combustor. So this is the setup, and we use a dilator for NH, 
and we use the Alexander laser and for, uh, for NH2. It's very difficult to find the Alexander laser now because this laser was developed for a medical purpose, not really for a combustion study. And luckily, we had one and uh, thanks to the shared facility and uh, in the lab. So I found this laser and uh, we spent uh, about a year to fix this laser and now it is functioning and we can use it to measure some use for species and for, uh, uh, for, our pro for our project. So this is a very preliminary result and we got recently and uh, from our work and which is NH2 PLE for measurement. So this is a direct photograph of flame and we shoot a laser beam right above the combustor. Um, and currently the challenge for us is the signal noise ratio is very low. So you see lots of noises. So the, the results are not as good as, uh, for example, OH belief. But uh, qual uh, qualitatively, we can still make some conclusions based on this preliminary measurement. And this, uh, so we conduct experiments at two different flow conditions, fuel in and fuel rich. Um, and the top figures are the H2 belief without plasma. And the bottom figures are NH2 PLEAF with plasma, as you can see, and with plasma and NH2 PLEAF signal is higher. And now we can see the higher PLEAF signal means higher NH2 production in that regime. And for NH PLEAF, NH PLEAF has a much better signal noise ratio. So what we did is uh, do, uh, we set up the uh, laser beam and then we move the combustor up and down. So each time we can scan about a 15 centimeters height uh, a downstream of the combustor. So this is uh, also a very preliminary result. And you can see this, this gives you a general feature of the flame without a plasma. And here is a feature, uh, is a general feature, the V-shaped flame and uh, with plasma. And uh, obviously with the help of plasma and uh, NH uh, a P leaf signal is much stronger compared to the case without a plasma. So plasma can definitely help produce an H. Um, so uh, um, uh, although the results are were conducted uh, uh, in uh, experiments using a combustor and we have flame. And it's good to use a flame to study uh, flame dynamics and have some good observations. But uh, regarding the fundamental kinetics of plasma ammonia interaction, Still, we could not get much information out from those type of work. So we have to conduct different types of work. And so to understand the fundamental kinetics uh, of plasma-assisted ammonia combustion, so we designed a simple reactor, so no flame in it. And it, we, we hope to generate a homogeneous reaction so we can do sampling and, uh, from the reactor. So this is a CAD model of the uh, or schematic of the reactor, and uh, it's a square glass tube. And outside, we put two electrodes, so we can generate discharge between these uh, two electrodes inside of this uh, square tube. And we have a uh, uh, ammonia oxygen argon mixtures flow through it, and we can adjust uh, the oxygen and the fuel concentration uh, and ratio. And the reason we use argon is to get rid of the effect of nitrogen. For most of the combustion system, nitrogen is the inert if we do not consider NOx emission, but uh, for ammonia. Nitrogen is not inert, it's a product. Uh, so that's the reason we use uh, argon. And downstream, and uh, we use the molecular, uh, uh, molecular beam mass spectrometry system. So this work is a collaboration with the Sandia Natural Lab uh, to take advantage of their uh, molecular beam system and to sample from the downstream of the reactor to see what kind of species could be produced um, in this process. And we can compare this uh, a result because the geometry is easy to model with a new, uh, numerical simulation and how people develop models. Okay, so first we only supplied uh, ammonia and argon into the reactor because we want to see the pyrolysis effect. And what we found is plasma, when ammonia and argon go through the reactor, significant amount of hydrogen can be produced. And in this figure, you see positive and negative. Positive means production, negative means consumption. So we have a production of nitrogen, we also have a significant production of hydrogen. So it's indicating, you know, plasma can also be used as a tool to decompose or uh, 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 crack ammonia 
and for different applications. Um, and we found, and with the increase of discharge voltage and also increase of resonance time, which means we slow down the flow, so the mixture can experience more discharge pulse inside of the plasma reactor, and more oxygen, sorry, more hydrogen can be produced, and more ammonium is consumed, and which is kind of straightforward result. And then we add uh, uh, oxygen uh, into the flow, and uh, to study ammonia, oxygen, and plasma interactions. And as you can see from uh, from this figure, so in the experiments, we change the oxygen more fraction, and uh, with the addition of oxygen, you see immediately decrease of hydrogen concentration because oxygen now start to oxidize hydrogen. And uh, also NOx emissions start to pop up and uh, during the oxidation of ammonia and NO, it is uh, produced. And also loss of water formation. Uh, and of course, ammonia is consumed and oxygen is consumed. And uh, this is the experiment at 40% uh, of ammonia uh, in the mixture. Uh, and if you, we decrease the fuel concentration, so we observe a similar phenomena, but uh, it's much easier to show in the figure because everything is too high, small change you cannot see. With 4% of ammonia concentration, the trend becomes to be pretty clear. With the increase of oxygen, because more O atom is available in the system, and NO concentration start to decrease, and uh, which is reasonable, and water formation start to increase, um, and ammonia uh, is consumed, and somehow we did not observe hydrogen uh, formation in that uh, uh, in this case. So our, uh, last week, my student arrived at Sandero National Lab. They're gonna have a, a, another one month experimental campaign to repeat the experiments and to refine, to tune the conditions of molecular beam system, try to probe different uh, uh, species. And interestingly, we didn't observe anything else. If you look at the kinetic model, they are uh, N2H2X uh, uh, related species, but we did not observe any. So now it's a big question mark. Are they really in the, uh, 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 are they really formed in the oxidation of uh, 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 ammonia oxidation process? So lots of work need to be done in the future about ammonia. Um, and uh, this figure shows you the NO formation. If we fix the mixture, for example, we have a 20% oxygen in the mixture, it is fixed. So the amount of O available to form NO or to oxidize ammonia is fixed. And what we change is the resonance time of the flow inside of the reactor and also the discharge voltage. As you can see, if we increase the, the resonance time of the mixture in the flow, NO concentration starts to decrease. That means the plasma is eating up the, is at, at, at least the hop eating up the NO in the mixture. And with the increase of discharge and the plasma becomes stronger, it's, uh, it also helps, the, helps to consume um, uh, NO. So stronger plasma, longer plasma treatment time, and the lower NO concentration. And interestingly, in this uh, reactor experiments, we observe and the plasma can decrease the NO concentration by about a factor 10, and from first over 4,000 ppm to about 400 ppm. Um, so I presented lots of experimental results. We observe you know, plasma can help produce NH2, and uh, can help to produce NO to enhance the combustion process. But if you do a very sim a simple simulation by you know, artificially decompose ammonia to NH2 and for example, H atom or hydrogen and put it into a very simple model, even zero dimensional model, and you run a simulation and you see increase of NOx rather than decreasing of NOx. So we still cannot uh, fully explain this phenomenon. So our collaborator and uh, uh, Professor Soyang's group from University of Minnesota, uh, we have a joint project for, uh, on plasma assisted combustion and they recently conducted a numerical simulation. They also did a, uh, a one dimensional, a zero dimensional simulation by applying nanosecond power discharge to ammonia air mixtures at different conditions. And what they found is plasma can reduce 
and can reduce NO emission. But, and a key is, we want to generate NH2 in a distributed way, not all at once. If we generate NH2 all at once, that means during the ignition, the NH2 concentration is so high, so much NH2 available, some of them will be oxidized and some of them will also be used to form NO. And the, a, a better way is to we gradually generate those NH2 and then have them consumed. So overall, and this figure shows the NH2 number density in terms of time. If you integrate this uh, curve, shows the NH2 production with the plasma, you have more H2 if you add them up. But if you look at the peak, it has a lower peak value. So, th uh, so th uh, this uh, uh, green and uh, red dashed line shows the case without a plasma. So you have, you have less H2, but a higher peak. So this peak value at that moment actually produced lots of NO and, uh, in the system. So based on the numerical simulation results and uh, also experimental observation, and uh, uh, one conclusion, uh, can be achieved uh, uh, at this moment is generating NH2 in our distributed way and for ammonia combustion and it can help reduce NO emission. So this could be used for when we design future uh, uh, ammonia combustion combustors. Currently there is no combustor designed for ammonia combustion. Um, okay, so this is all I uh, uh, want to talk about today. At the end, a, a quick summary about our work and we conducted the, the experiments on plasma-assisted ammonia combustion. We found two benefits of plasma, and it can enhance ammonia flame, and it could also help reduce NO emission of ammonia flame. And uh, probably NH2 play a critical role and in this process, and of course, lots of further studies are, are needed and to understand this process and how we use it for uh, ammonia uh, for ammonia combustion. And we also found plasma can uh, crack ammonia efficiently and generate hydrogen um, and, and for different applications. At the end, I would uh, like to acknowledge the support of this work from ASF and also the low temperature plasma research facility and from Sandia, uh, from Sandia National Lab. Thank you very much. That's a nice talk. Any questions? Yeah, again, I, I agree. Uh, lovely work. The experiments are terrific. And a lot of insights, a lot of stuff to process. In the second half of the talk, where you were probing these insights mm -hmm. for the first, yeah. that you could see a plasma reduction in other. Yeah. Uh, I'm thinking back to slide 10. Mm -hmm. Slide 10, you were looking at some literature that seemed to complement what you had done, what you had initially found. Now yeah. on that top right slide, mm -hmm. you see that in fuel rich conditions, it's plummeting the, the NOx down to near zero in mm -hmm. those rich conditions. Your subsequent experiments and insights, is that a thermal um, balance effect? Yeah, good question. Uh, I don't know what's happened over there. Probably it's too low, cannot be shown here because it's not my work. <laughs> but uh, based on our observation, you still have an O over there, even though the concentration might be low. Sure, but you can see the trend. It's yeah. definitely going down. Right. Is it a thermal denox effect? Probably. So currently, uh, the uh, understanding is the thermal denox process. So because in the past, ammonia is used to reduce NO uh, using uh, 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 this thermal denox process, probably. But the issue is, uh, when we move to fuel rich side, ammonia becomes to be part of the emission. So we still have trouble. And also, at that high temperature conditions, and the loss of hydrogen is produced is at a percentage level. So that's the, the also what we observed for experiments without a plasma. You see, on the red axis, hydrogen is percentage level. So this is definitely something you do not want to see in the emission. Yeah. That's right. Really nice work. Uh, based on the things that you're looking for as far as what comes out of the combustion product, you know, you're looking at H2, NO, mm. uh, and ammonia, it almost seems like, you, you know, you can't help think that maybe staging the combustion process may be helpful. Right? Mm -hmm. If you have yeah. NO, you can right. select the yeah. reduction, uh -huh. you can do yeah. hydrogen mm -hmm. and oxygen reactant. Yeah. 
ammonia and slip, you could do the same thing. Right. So what, is there like a follow-up uh -huh. to this? Yeah. I, I Thank you for asking them. that. Yeah. I didn't pay him. <laughs> and uh, this is uh, uh, what uh, actually we worked on uh, uh, from, uh, uh, under a different project. And actually, we just had a paper accepted about the staging concept to design ammonia combustor is accepted by uh, ACS energy letters. Um, and what we found is if we design, if we can optimize a stage of the combustor, for example, we burn fuel rich first, then in the emission there are lots of ammonia, hydrogen, and then we have a lean stage, and we optimize the condition over there, and we can get rid of most of uh, NO and also hydrogen. So we can meet the standard of EPA. But it's reduced order modeling and uh, just give us a concept. Theoretically, is it possible to burn ammonia at the field? And the conclusion is yes. And our paper also showed, you know, at these conditions, so we should uh, focus on and can help and those conditions in terms of pressure and temperature and uh, uh, equivalence ratio can help re bring down the NO using this method uh, uh, to, uh, to be compliant with the EPA standard. Thank you again for asking. <laughs> yeah, Jack. Yeah, um, regarding the technology you use for the plasma discharge, is there, does this scale to like larger combustors? In mm -hmm. other words, you've got, you've got a pretty critical dependence. The flame's going to exist if you put the plasma there. It may, well, may not exist if mm -hmm. you don't. Yeah. So you've got a lot of system level things that you have to think about if you put this into a larger scale system. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do, do these techniques work continuously, robustly, mm -hmm. all, the, all the time, or is there some issues you've got to deal with? Yeah. Um, that's another challenging question. Uh, um, and the issue of plasma is it's very difficult to scale up. Um, as you can see, for example, in our combustor, it's just a a few inch in terms of diameter, but in practical application, the engine is much bigger, right? And definitely, we cannot have one plasma injector and sustain all the sustain the entire engine. And very similar to the ideas of a bunch of fuel injectors, and the people normally do is to have a different plasma injectors too, and to hop at a different regions. And actually, and uh, for example. And one application of a plasma reactor is the production of uh, ozone. And uh, some companies, they build up an uh, ozone generator and with a diameter several meters. And so the idea is to bundle different plasma reactors together uh, so you can produce a large amount of ozone. So similar, similar ideas if we want to apply plasma into a practical system. So one plasma reactor is not a possible. So we have to have multiple reactors. So we have to optimize the location, optimize the operating conditions to see and how they affect uh, the uh, combustion so process. Just a follow-up question. Like yeah. those, that optimization would, would likely, you'd like to have some numerical tools that could help. Yeah. You. But I know it's a challenge to do direct simulations of plasma combustion interaction. So is there any... <laughs> Reduce, reduced order modeling or anything that's actually allowing an engineer to do, like address mm -hmm. these kinds of trade-off studies that you would need? Yeah, and plasma kinetics has a very short time scale. Normally, it's a sub-nanoseconds. And the combustion process normally have a much longer, even though combustion is already faster, but comparing to plasma, combustion is slow. And plasma typically have a time scale, let's say, microseconds or sub-milliseconds level. So if you do a new Marco simulation, this becomes to be a very stiff problem. Takes a very long time and to simulate because you have to use a very small time step to simulate to capture the change of plasma. And but it also gives us an opportunity to decouple this process. So this is one of the techniques, for example, and when So Young worked, worked with me and we implemented to model a plasma assisted combustion process. So decouple those things. And while plasma property is changing, combustion property is not changing. So then we can assume plasma is at a steady state and then come back to calculate the combustion process. And also regarding the reduced order modeling, and similar to the reduced order modeling of, or reduced uh, kinetic models of combustion system, it can be achieved. And uh, uh, our collaborator, Soyang, is uh, working on that. And also developing, for example, numerical tools and how do we model this uh, 
stiff system using, for example, large eddy simulation and or direct numerical simulation. It's a very challenging topic. Yeah. Questions? Where the students? And mm -hmm. I know that, at least within like ammonia flames, like it's also that if you have an overabundance of o OH and hydroxide radicals, this also tends to also can create more NOx. Right? That is right. So, um, is is there like maybe I might have missed it, but is there like um, some numerical campaigns that can possibly measure like the global equivalence ratio, to, like, <coughs> you know, or maybe. Mole uh, NH2 like density within the flame because mm -hmm. like maybe that can like you know give a better like at least a contour like yeah maybe it will clear up something uh -huh. is there anything that's being done like that? right um and currently no and regarding the fundamental kinetics of ammonia and I mentioned somewhere briefly in the in my talk and our understanding about uh, ammonia kinetics is still problematic there are existing different kinetic models if you pull them up. Uh, maybe I have it here, let me see. And uh, it gives you very different result. And if you do a numerical simulation, for example here, um, and you got a factor 10 difference, and you do not know which one really to trust. So that is the one of the outstanding issue about ammonia combustion. For example, this is from our uh, another work and using the shock tube to study ammonia kinetics. All the lines are kinetic models in literature. You put them up and you see you calculate some global parameters like auto ignition delays, and the difference can be a hundred times. And what we found is, you know, there is no model can reproduce the experimental result at different conditions. At certain conditions, and our results uh, agreed with the top one, the dots agreed with the, the orange colored line on the top. At certain conditions, it agrees with the line on the bottom. <laughs> so there is no such a model can reproduce experimental result at all, all different conditions. And uh, we do not know which model we should trust. Yeah. So uh, you talk mostly about, uh, very nice, very nice talk by the way. So uh, you talk mostly about privileged flames, right? So mm -hmm. where you have uh, reactants already mixed and then you're using plasma to kind of start some reactions there. Or yeah. Basically writing the formation. But what about if you have a mixture which has not mixed yet? Mm -hmm. And what, uh, what will be the procedure there and how the plasma is going to help in that? Oh, great question. So uh, without a plasma, the combustion community is also looking into the idea of a diffusion flame, not a pre-mixing them. And they do have some benefits in terms of NOx emission, but still research in progress because traditionally we want to mix hydrocarbon fuels with air to burn so we can decrease NOx, but it seems like it's not the case anymore. And regarding plasma, and if we apply plasma to a diffusion flame system, we have to consider where we want to apply to it. If we apply it to the ammonia side or the fuel side, and we are correcting ammonia, generating hydrogen, and then radicals will recombine quickly, probably especially at high pressure conditions. If we apply plasma into the oxygen conditions, probably not that, much, not that helpful because we generate O atoms and O atoms are going to recombine quickly. And, and so it so seems like we have to put it into the fuel side. If we put it into the fuel side, we generate the hydrogen-ammonia mixture. It does not help reduce NOx. It can help stabilize the flame for sure, but uh, the NOx emission will still be high because the NOx formation mechanism is from the fuel bond the nitrogen, not uh, from, for example, the that which conventional that which mechanism. As far as you have 1% ammonia in the mixture, yeah, NOx emission is high. Translational temperature for plasma assisted combustion? Um, 
translational temperature is, a, for example, typical temperature we talk about for combustion system. And uh, it's uh, the kinetic energy of molecule. It has no selectivity in terms of generating radicals. It's just a collision and uh, uh, break a chemical bond. So if you increase the translational temperature, you enhance all reactions. And the benefit of plasma is it, can, it has certain selectivity. It can help to break, for example, O atoms, uh, can help to break oxygen, generate O atoms, rather than enhancing other, uh, other reactions. So you can uh, uh, optimize the operating condition of plasma and select, okay, this is the energy I want uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the plasma goes into the energy channel. So we'll break more oxygen or break more fuel molecules. So that's the, the difference. So when the discharge voltage increases or the power increases, you basically do more radical reaction compared to increasing the transmission. Exactly. Right. Transmission mm -hmm. temperature doesn't uh, change a whole lot. Like different power uh, it will also change. But uh, for example, for discharge, only a fraction of energy is used to heat up the mixture. Majority of uh, energy is used to excite different molecules or generating ionization. Other questions? Okay. okay. I don't know if it's quick or not, yeah. but you, you had uh, the uh, the blood uh, limits mm -hmm. and, uh, and the different uh, you know, equivalence ratios and yeah. flow rates. The, the shapes of the curves are different, and I was kind of curious to see why. Um, so for no uh -huh. plasma. Yeah. <clears throat> you mean here? Yes. Uh huh. So for no plasma, you can see uh, it's basically uh, sort of the, you know, as an angle. So. Right, yeah. And for the other ones, we have a positive slope. Mm -hmm. And I was kind of curious to see what uh, was the mechanism behind it. Uh huh. Uh, yeah, good question. So during our study, what we found is uh, the limb below out limit is also very sensitive to initial conditions. Uh, so we do not have a, uh, a full explanation about that, but that is the phenomenon we observed. So maybe that's something we need to dig into in the future. Okay, let's thank our speaker again. Thank you very much. Thank you guys for coming. See you next time. Very nice. Thank you. Hi, my name is Megan. I'm working on the new project. So I have a question. So, so Dr. Ecker is working on Hormonia? Yes. <laughs> That's good to know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I was just thinking that is Actually, no, because the plasma is the only nanosecond pulse. It's very short. It's too short to affect the flow pattern. And in the combustor, we have a swirling flow with a pretty strong. So the interaction, I mean, the effect of plasma on the flow is very minimal. So we did not see any flow pattern effect. Okay. So, like you said, plasma is helping in stabilizing the chemistry. Yes. 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 Yes.
by the time the call yeah, goes out, the there are slots that are filled. Yeah, we have to work with the water. Send to it. Now, if you want to email somebody, you have to send them now for next No, even when the email was sent out, you invite people, they were like already like half the slots are taken. Kind of so, late, but it's a bluff. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. And, you know, my students are telling me that you know, it's like you know, most of the talks are not relevant to what they're doing. I mean, I think it kind of broadens the horizon and everything. Yeah, I think today students kind of weekly yeah, yeah. 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 Right, we do. And uh, we can measure the yeah. surface. But this, I like guess, is for some battery. Yeah, some we can do that kind of measurement. But what we found is without plasma, we got very little of stabilizer. Oh, yes. You know, yes. we are supposed to have Yeah, we move to the addition close to the plasma. Yeah, I don't even understand what they are. Basically, we cannot do better. Got it. 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 Yo, I'm very impressed about the campus. It's a very beautiful campus. Beautiful. Yeah, that's yeah. the same. Have you seen the lake? Dream, actually. Uh -huh. Have you seen the lake? We have a lake. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I saw yeah. the lake and yeah. also the library. Yeah. 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 The first day when I came, I was uh -huh. just walking around. I saw a lake and then there was a nice trail. Yeah, right. Yeah. I was so yeah. impressed. There's even a golf course. I, I, oh, yeah. I mean, yeah. I don't do golf, but there's a golf course. Yeah, and yeah. when you walk on the street, you can feel the space, right? Yeah. Yeah. Nice, nice weather. Nice weather. Yes, yeah. 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 Well, the weather, you know, can be, you know. Yeah, that's why I said it. I, I, I truly enjoyed my visit, you know. Yeah. It's so nice. Yeah. Yeah, let's walk you back. Okay. Yeah. I need to stop. Uh, for the lunch, department lunch. Uh,